All right, I'll dive right in and uh, apologize for uh, going right through the break. And I know some of you may need to get up and uh, stretch and, and, and come on out and come back, but uh, feel free. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit when we're talking about education and training directorate because you need to understand uh, from some of my colleagues who have been presenting, as you've heard, DHA has been in existence now for a year. Educa 429 days. Yes, sir. Education and training directorate, on the other hand, just stood up in August. So we're the new kids in the block in we many call ways. That quibbling. We call <laughs> that quibbling. And, uh, and I've been on board since September. So uh, it, it actually uh, is a pleasure to be here. Now, in deference to my colleagues here, I think I got the, the best of all worlds because not only do I get to be a part of this great organization uh, with an important mission, but I'm the only director that is not headquartered in the DC area. So I get the pleasure of living in San Antonio. Uh, which is which is a very nice thing, and that is because of my second hat as the uh, as a METC commandant, and and that drives uh, my being uh, at this point in time in evolution. It makes a lot of sense that the education and training director would uh, be at historic Fort Sam. So, Master Chief, I appreciate that. So here is uh, here's our mission and vision, and and obviously is uh, a work in progress. Um, kind of to set the stage, understanding that you know when. Things moved over from health affairs over to DHA. For a lot of the directorates, um, there were pieces in place, bodies, resources, just kind of got up and moved positions. Not, not the case for, for ENT. I mean, this is something brand spanking new, and so kind of creating from scratch. So that when this was created, what was decided was at the headquarters, there would be eight individuals, three O6s, three E9s a GS-15, and an executive assistant. As of Monday, I got five in place. Very, uh, very glad to hear that and uh, should be full up in the next four to six months. Uh, but we're moving out, and we may be small in numbers compared to some of the other directorates, but uh, very much high in quality. Master Chief, go to the next slide. So here is our uh, org chart. And, and once again, less important to look at the fine print, especially um, just understanding that we're broken up into, into three divisions, and of those different deliverables underneath, we're going to see those in the next couple slides, so we'll go into those. But an important part I do want to highlight is if you kind of look at the bottom left there, three organizations that now fall under Education and Training Directorate are the biggie is METC, and that's why I am dual-hatted. Two other organizations are, and I apologize for the acronyms, Medical Education Training Campus, for those that uh, for don't... Uh, uh, know those vernaculars, but Dimmertai, the Defense Medical Readiness Training Institute, is presently under Colonel John Gar uh, at Fort Sam, and Jay Messy, the Joint Medical Executive Skills Institute under Dr. Rosemary DeRica, also at Fort Sam. So you got a readiness training piece, and you got a leadership, more of an online training capability. Very important assets. And um, if you go back one slide, I'm sorry, before we go there, off to the left there, you know, the question is, well, how do you link up with the the different services as far as guidance. Well, there was already a piece in place uh, for METC, and realizing that organization has been in existence for four years, but you see there, there's a senior coordinating council. So there is representation. I have the opportunity to interact directly with the leadership from uh, BUMED M7. Right now, that's Rabbi McCormick Boyle, who is at Fort Sam. Uh, as far as uh, AMED Center and School, Major General Jones is also at Fort Sam in the Air Force. CSG-1 is now Brigadier General Potter. He's the one, uh, one person that wouldn't be in that local area. So that is a, a positive relationship. You'll see UCIS down there. There's some collaboration there. And the other thing is the uh, Healthcare ITO Interservice Training Office. Off, it's kind of a dotted line off to the right, uh, also located in, in Fort Sam. So a lot of goodness as far as things that are coming, uh, coming together in that location. We go, so that's IOC. If we go to the next slide at F, uh, other direction, there we go, at FOC, um, obviously more deliverables end up on the slide. And the other thing that changes is that, that uh, uh, Senior Coordinating Ch Council changes to a military medical educational consortium. Still kind of having the same players, but, but the idea is creating a relationship that not only has uh, those military leaders, but you start developing partnerships with different civilian organizations uh, that, that might uh, be beneficial as far as the future, not only of METC, but the way we're doing education and training uh, for the DHA. Uh, I think that's about it. So we go to the next slide, and we're going to go into two slides that have 
nine deliverables. A lot of lofty goals, and obviously um, all can't be weighted equally. Some are more important than others. And I'm going to talk about some of those more important ones a little more, although I'll touch on all of them very briefly. Right off the bat, obviously, aligning Metsi, Dimmertai, and Jay Messi under the DHA is important. I mean, they're realizing that metsi has been in existence since 2010, the other two have been around for a while under AMED. I mean, there's just a lot of processes as far as how business has been done that need to be realigned and how we're going to continue moving out. But very, very helpful to have those organizations under uh, education and training. Second bullet there, I've kind of already touched on developing this military medical educational consortium, something that's kind of down the road. But the third one's a biggie. Uh, complete a study plan to assess critical skills acquisition and sustainment for medical personnel, kind of touching on TC3, the Tactical Combat Casualty Care. You know, it was highlighted today by uh, Dr. Woodson how, how good we are as far as once we get casualties uh, downrange into one, one of our uh, echelons of care and, and their chance of survival. If there is probably an opportunity for some improvement, it's kind of looking at that spectrum of care from maybe point of injury until they arrive at that initial echelon, whatever that may be. And, and so that's where courses like Tactical Combat Casualty Care, TC3, and I realize when I throw that out, it means something a little bit different to everybody. How initial training's done, sustainment training, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts there. It is something worthwhile for us to uh, kind of get our arms around. And so understanding that Dimmertai now falls under education training, here's a unique opportunity, but realizing that education training does have a staff of eight, it is even more important for my directorate to be partnering, developing those strategic relationships internally within the DHA, and that's why I reach out to other directors. So Healthcare Ops has a readiness division. They've got smart folks who have been dealing with TC3 and live animal training. And, and once again, you can see if, if live animals go away, well, that impacts modern sim kind of initiative. And it, it all kind of intermingles, but I think you're going to see a lot of at times you'll say, wow, I wonder if that falls under ENT or is that healthcare ops or is that R&D? It really doesn't matter. I mean, we're, we're one big happy family and we're going to need to work together to kind of figure out how do we do this well so that when the combatant commander defines their requirements for their deployers, then they can come to us and then we can make sure that we're offering the right type of courses. And the way, like with TC3, I mean, I see it down the road that it'd be very similar to that spectrum of uh, how we do BLS or just uh, basic CPR training for everybody all the way up to the end of the spectrum where advanced cardiac life support is done for certain medics. Uh, that spectrum is probably appropriate for how we can evolve TC3 training and once again looking at that, that spectrum of care from point of injury to initial echelon. So a very important initiative for education and training. Next bullet, um, support to the GME selection board is, is going to be a biggie. That's, that's not one that is uh, high up right off the bat. The bottom one you've already heard about, consolidating the learning management, st excuse me, learning management system um, from HIT, and, and clock's already ticking on that one. So we have until next summer uh, when MHS Learn retires and goes away. So once again, working with the HIT directorate, a lot of work is going to be ongoing on moving everything that is presently uh, in MHS Learn over to Joint Knowledge Online and, and other different uh, uh, systems are going to be migrating over time. So lots of uh, important work that will be going on in that initiative. Master Chief, you can go to the next slide. Another biggie right up the top, developing a plan of action and milestones for academic affiliation opportunities between MetC and UCIS. There has been uh, questions that have been raised partly from the White House Roundtable Initiative uh, and other avenues that say, you know, we have medics trained out of medicine. They walk out and they get great training and they can spend potentially a career in the military, get out, and then they can't get a job in whatever career they're in because they don't have that certificate or they don't have that degree that is required. So looking at opportunities, partnering with organizations like UCIS or potentially other organizations are something that I think is critically important for the METC piece of education and training. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, the next area dealing with the whole conference approval process, uh, getting the meetings uh, is, is one that's up there and we're going to be working with healthcare ops on that one. Uh, 
The second to the last bullet, mod and sim, I've already touched on also, is another critical one. A very important initiative to Dr. Woodson. And as you can see, once again, getting back to the, the readiness ops training, if live animals go away, having a centralized plan in place for mod and sim. We have lots of uh, interesting working groups and goodness going on between the Army, Navy, and Air Force with their different uh, programs that they're doing with mod and sim, but kind of getting it under a central chain of command makes a whole lot of sense. So a lot of effort going into getting our hands around this over the upcoming year. And then the final bullet, just kind of looking at overall leadership development and, and the GME process. Next slide. So progress to date. Um, stand up of, uh, of DHA education and training. Right off the bat, e-learning, as we've talked about, I mean, the clock is ticking, and so we really have to put a lot of effort into that and get that done over the upcoming year. The second bullet dealing with professional development. Luckily, we do have organizations like J. Messi that has an online learning tool already in place. So there is stuff that is going on with that to support our folks. And, and finally, uh, centralized training review process. You know, what we don't have is just a single consolidated list of every training course out there for all services across the board so that we can look and say, hey, where are there overlaps, where are there gaps, how do we, uh, how do we uh, improve the educational training opportunities based on the requirements, once again, defined by the services, by the combatant commanders. But uh, that's a starting point that has already begun. Next slide. Now I'm going to switch gears a minute and, and for two slides kind of focus on some pretty cool things going on at METC. There's no slides here specific on METC, and I'm going to assume that a lot of you know about the uh, medical education and training campus. If not, I mean, just in, in a nutshell, it's where we do uh, our enlisted medical training to train the best medics, corpsmen, and techs. Uh, and right now, 49 courses that are offered, 36 of them are consolidated to some degree, uh, and, and we're still working on others. So in any given day, there are 6,000 students walking around that campus. And for those that have been there, you kind of know this, but it was a surprise to me. I mean, my office is right next to the dining facility. And you know, and if, you're, if you're in a headquarters setting or you've been working in a clinic or hospital, the first time you're sitting in your office and 6,000 people are marching in cadence, singing out Jody's, going to breakfast, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it, I, I've got a cool job. And it's very inspiring. And that is, that is, you know, three times a day, 365 days out of the year. I mean, when they graduate, you know, some 20, 21,000 very inspired, motivated medics in, in all these different career fields. So it is, it's just, it's a great place to be, I, ha I have to admit. But once again, getting back to that presidential initiative and how can we best support these folks. So the, the line you're going to be hearing is we can train for the mission. We do that well. We did it before METC. We're doing it still today. But we can also educate for a lifetime. And, and that's, you know, educating for a lifetime of service and not only supports these folks so that when they get out, uh, they're not having to use GI benefits to repay for education that they may not need, but they need the certificate. It supports their communities where there's a need for medics. And, and you know, just thinking about uh, folks being out of work, I mean, once again, sometimes it's hard to measure the savings you get from that. But a place we've started is developing partnerships with different uh, civilian uh, higher schools of learning that are now partnering with us in these kind of branching programs that, and you can't see the pins, but just to know that the red pin is uh, associate degree programs, kind of a two-year program. The blue is uh, bachelor, green is master, and the yellow are ones that are kind of in, in process of being uh, developed. But in these kind of bridging programs now, these different schools are recognizing the curriculum, recognizing the credits that are coming from our students to say, okay, given everything you've done, you only need to complete maybe this additional piece. Uh, and a lot of times it's kind of the general education requirements, kind of like the math and English. But small pieces that they can then walk away with a, with a bachelor's degree. I mean, it's so critical. In addition to that, we do, I think, need to look at each of the, of the different career fields to figure out what do we need to do so that they are meeting the civilian certification requirements. Similar to what we do at UCIS for, you know, if you're a doc, if you're a dentist or you're a nurse, the civilian requirements kind of set the bar. It's different with enlisted training. I mean, we, we train to the mission, but we can train for the mission, but we can still educate for a lifetime. 
So we go to the next slide, and, and this is just one real-life success story, and I'll introduce you to Shane Gabriel. So this young man came through METSI. He was a part uh, of the Army National Guard and is a combat medic, trained in the 68 Whiskey course. Finished it up, did great, but was interested in doing more and heard about one of those bridging programs called the Military to RN program, looked into it and, and kind of tackled it. And essentially, one of these bridging programs gave him a, what turned out to be a, a semester's worth of credit for his 68 Whiskey program, so that in a period of 13 months, this gentleman got his RN. And on top of that, he was just recently married, his wife was in nursing school, and they had a new baby. So it was important to him that he was a stay-at-home dad for five days of the week. Most of his courses, if not all, were online, except for his clinical courses, which he did on those two days when his wife was home, and he could go and take care of the clinical courses. So once again, 13 months, because he got that semester's credit in the bridging program, this guy is now a practicing RN in San Antonio. And now, he has the option, and he's seriously looking at, there's a second bridging program where he can get his BSN, uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing, which would they're going to recognize him again and probably give him another semester's worth of credit, and it would take him about 12 more months if he, if he wanted to do it, and he'd walk away with a BSN. And then, it, you know, at that point, he's going to have to decide, do I want to consider applying, you know, and get my commission? I mean, so great things like this are happening. In my mind, this is exactly the kind of further development and partnership that needs to come from USHIS, or come from uh, the collaboration with USHIS, with other entities, and then even down the road, you can even say, well, shoot, should METSI be a degree granting? institution. And those are the kind of questions uh, that we're asking at this stage of development. Next slide. So, kind of touched on a lot of these, but these are the, the post-FOC initiatives. Um, consolidation is important. And like I said, we're not fully consolidated, but the bottom line is consolidation does work. And we want to make sure if we don't consolidate that there is a mission-specific reason that we're not, and it's just not a cultural the way we've always done it. Obviously, I've talked a little bit about uh, the combat casualty care and kind of looking hard at how we're going to be doing training down the road, mod and sim, uh, looking at our con ops in general, and then finally, once again, uh, affiliations with uh, degree-granting institutions like UCIS or other civilian uh, institutions, and then potentially even the future of, uh, of METSI being one of those degree-granting institutions. And I believe that is my last slide. Yep, I think we're good. So with that, I'll open up the floor to any questions you may have. Go back to the uh, FOC slide. So, uh, I think what's important here is if you look at the left there, okay, when we were creating this thing called the Education and Training Directory, uh, the, the services went back to the support group and came back with kind of how they were going to set it up. And, and they kept coming back with more of the same. In other words, it was kind of just rearranging the deck chairs. Okay? And I, there was a couple of real smart folks out there that kept whispering in their ears and said, there's a, different, there's a different vision, there's a different end state you might want to consider. So I kept talking about it. So I go back, and they come back, you know, they more the same. I go back, you know, I'm just telling you how this works, back and forth. And so finally, someone got it, okay? But it doesn't come across clear here, but if you look at this first block over here, let me see here, this is important, okay? Instead of setting this thing up like from stovepipe, okay, they said, hey, how about setting it up like for one, a university model, university model, not university of, but a university model for a session, okay? And then think about the power of that. All right, so, so General Miller talked about that, but really what you have here is, 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 is you're bringing this whole consortium together, they're calling it a consortium, consortium right now, but, but the vision is it's a university model. So in the university model, you know, you still have colleges. College of Nursing, College of Public Health, College of Medicine, 
then you got your, uh, what I call your vocational schools, and you've got all these different, but, but, but the university, okay, unites them with a common vision and a common end state that meets the needs, you know, if it's a, if it's a state university, it meets the needs of the population, okay? So instead of them just sitting there by themselves, you're bringing it together. And then you can tweak, maybe, we hope, okay, then you can start tweaking, you know, what, what the input and the output ought to be of the, of, the, of the, what I call the colleges inside the university based on the needs of the enterprise and the services. So when you look at this, you know, you've got uniform services now. This is key. I don't want you to go back and tell me, hey, Dr. Weiss is working with the DHA. <laughs> no, no, don't even think about it. Okay, Dr. Rice direct reports to Dr. Woodson. Okay, all right. And the reason he does that is because <coughs> right now that works best for the university. Okay, all right. But what you're doing is you're saying he's part of this consortium. He sits at the table. All right. So you've got your graduate school. You got your undergraduate schools, you got your vocational schools, and you got your professional schools. The accessions all sitting together. So you can work stuff together. And I saw that model work beautifully uh, down at uh, a lot of the medical universities are doing the same thing where they're sharing, like the dental school, the nursing school, the medical school, okay, the doctor school, or sharing common cores, just like Mitchell does. Okay, and then they and then they tweak, you know, their colleges. So there's a lot of opportunities. So let's set it up that way and see where we go. And see where we go. Alright, so this is pretty exciting. Now, if you look over here, okay, that's accession. Really only two kinds of training we do in the military. It's accession training and what? Not all at once. <laughs> Sustainment, right? Sustainment training. All right, so they were coming back, you know, I said, put them, put the lights, put the lights, okay? So this is basically, you know, you start to coalesce, okay, where it makes sense, where a joint first solution or a joint first core makes sense for sustainment training. All right, so that's fundamentally the two pillars Okay, of the education and training director. Now, what was law, what I didn't quite understand, you know, because I don't live in that privileged world, okay, is, you know, you're not doing anything without this, okay? You know, that, the, the academic rigor and the oversight is key, okay? And then again, you know, centralize that, all right? All right, so, so, so that you drive where it makes sense, okay, a joint for a solution, all right? And then one of the big initiatives which I think I heard on there was how many nurses in here? Okay, how many how many medics enlisted medics in here? Okay, uh, nurses, raise your hand again. What's the biggest problem between the services right now at SAMC and Walter Reed? It's defining what what defining what the standard of practice is for the medics enlisted medics because they don't call the same thing the same thing. Uh, you think the academic oversight, you know, are, 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 are able, you know, if I'm working for a nurse, you know, making sure that you got all these, you know, blocks checked. I mean, they got it at the top. And that's right. Because it, so, so we may not train, the scope of practice for our medics may not need, doesn't need to be the same for each one of our medics, okay? Because the Army scope of practice is different, because what they're doing in the field is different, maybe than in the Navy, maybe than the Air Force. You don't need to train them all in the same scope of practice, but what you do train them to, at least call it the same doggone thing. So that when you check them off, so when you can have them work for you in the wards, so an army nurse isn't saying, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sign off or oversee that airport, because I don't know what they're doing. What's the same thing? It doesn't say that here. But they were trained in the same thing we were told them. So that's key that we're gonna we're, we're, we're gonna try to rationalize the nomenclature, okay, portfolio, and when I'm hearing from the nurses and from the list corps, that's their number one priority right now. So we get the most bang on the buck in our, you know, the Walter Reeds, okay, in the SAMCs, in the launch. Okay, that's where we're going, okay? And that's where we've already been at the Bagger, the Balaz, the MC, and the Candle.
Okay, so that's key right up there. And then again, this is, this is, I, I'm probably as excited about where these guys are going as anybody. Okay, if you can't figure that out. Because the potential here is so cool. Okay, long overdue, and the opportunity is unlimited. And I don't know if you want to throw a comment on that anymore, that we haven't really heard about that. But, 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 but I was working this before August, so I do remember a little bit of this, so yeah. No, and I can just say, you know, having been an ATC SG the last two years, I've seen how far Metsy's come, and it's, it's, you know, it, it takes time. I mean, Yusha's has been around since the 70s. Metsy's only four years old. They've come a long way. Still some challenges, but once again, it's, it's exciting to see how many civilian institutions want to jump on board. Oh, yeah. They know this is a good thing. I mean, there, there, there's awards coming out of this as far as best practices, and, and most importantly, I think it's the right thing to do. So once again, train for the mission educate for a lifetime, and I think we can do both. Yes, sir. Hey, Colonel Neil Johnson from uh, U.S. Metcom. We kind of live somewhere inside and outside DHS up there, but I'm, I'm interested in what you said about the centralized credentialing for uh, licensed independent practitioners. Are you implying that there could be a centralized credentialing process that is a, across the board that into, or is everybody going to tap into, or are we still going to do it, you know, NCF by NCF by NCF? I'll take that. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Then, all right, so, and I like that. It's a great example of, again, you know, and, uh, I wrote something down, because I also don't want you to go run back to this, geez, and I get a phone call. Um, where was it? Um, General Miller didn't need to say, okay, Centralized chain of command for medical simulation and training. He didn't really mean to say that. He meant to say a more standardized application of, of, of what we're going to do. Because You're right, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You'd be surprised when he gets back to your, to your staff and they have to do. What he meant to say was there's no centralized command for It's unity of effort here. Make that an I'm supporting. They're supporting. Okay. So, but. Some people say, do we need a shared services called credential? Okay, now, the answer is, it's dependent on how you define shared services. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you because it's about time we gotta come up with a different term, and I'm not sure what it means, okay? Shared service can mean anything from, I mean, the default is, if it's a shared service, and I'm doing it for you, okay? You know, somebody's doing something for you, okay? Uh, uh, or, 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 but it's a full spectrum where what we need to do is, is we need to standardize the way we credential. There's a difference, okay? There's a difference, all right? And these guys are gonna take that on, okay? Yes, sir. All right, so <laughs> they're gonna take this on, and what we tried to do it by committee before, okay? Folks remember this. It worked, they agreed. Okay, the committee of said, hey, it's where we're gonna go. Then they get back to the services, and it doesn't get prioritized. Okay, not because they didn't believe in it, not because it wasn't important, but it just didn't get prioritized. And, and again, that, 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 that the default of the meet to one there. What, what we're gonna do is drive, we're gonna be able to drive centralized, and then we take it to the governance. We didn't have a governance model before, okay? And then, then, then they'll, they'll make a decision. These guys made more decisions in the last 15 months, 12 months, and I've seen them in the three and a half years I was here before. Okay, then, 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 then we go forward. No more, you know, go back. <coughs> no, we're at, so we'll, we'll drive that. Now, a shared service credentialing would be we centralize credentialing and then the DHA does it for you. Hell no. Okay, <laughs> that's not going to happen. At least not on my watch. Okay, but, but so that's what people are worried about. Oh, the DHA. No, we don't. But what the DHA will do, okay, which is what the community practice is trying to do, is drive a, central, a standardized <coughs> credentialing process and then hand it over. To the services to execute, okay, and then we're the keeper of the scroll, so to speak, and we tweak it. And you guys come up with a new requirement, or 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 then we drive it, we feed it over to policy, and the policy drives whatever we need. Yeah, but yeah, so that's kind of the end of the spectrum of the shared service. But you bet. You be asking me. He's up on well, this is so related to the credentialing thing. The biggest, the one of the big problems we have now is, you know, we've been using CC Quas centralized. Well, it's not centralized because every single. MTF makes you redo the whole thing every time you go there. What would be useful is if you move from MTF to MTF and say, 
your credential here is an internist or a heart surgeon or an orthopod, therefore we're not going to make you go through credentials again, you're already credentialed in this one system. And that's, that's an actual centralized system, but you know, that, that's the thing that's driving people nuts, is every time you move, you go from the Air Force hospital and then the Army wants to re-credential yeah, you. Yeah, we have, and, so to answer your question, and then there's folks here that probably, well, I'm going to get to sit in as many meetings as I used to, I sit in a different set of meetings. But that is, that is a, I would like to tell you that's been solved, and it keeps saying it's been solved, and then I come to find out it's not, okay? But I can tell you, we're trying to solve it, okay? And, and they keep telling me we're close. And I, say, I get cooler in my office, I'm like, yeah, what's going on with this, Googler? I thought you told me we were done with this. So, but, but, Yes, we're, you know, in fact, write that down. And for the docs, okay, the, the kill hole will begin again. Okay, so, yeah, but you, God, we, we, we've been, uh, I've been up here four and a half years, and, and I, I don't know how many memories I got. Yeah, yeah, I got it. And, and I, we're so close, I can't figure out why we had to jump off the cliff. I don't know. We'll go back and find out. It's part of the stuff. Bowen, you know anything about that? From an HIT support, is it an HIT support issue? Uh, from a systems perspective, we're trying to. Consolidating the infrastructure that supports that, but it's really a it's really a medical policy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, and I, and I thought we were there, and, and, and you're right. Yeah, got it. I, I got it. You know, your job is to give me tasks when I, I got it. I'm going to find out. Make sure you get his name. I get back to him with another question. Yep. Yep. I'm in Korea. Currently, I'm currently. So I have a twofold question. Uh, piggybacking a little bit on the credentials question. Are we looking at standardizing the constant based orientation? Because that's another thing. Having been in IT for 16 years, I need to learn processes and perhaps what equipment is different from one NTS to another, but I don't need to relearn how to be an IT nurse every six weeks or eight weeks long every time I go from NTS to NTS. So are we utilizing something like MOSIS to standardize that? And my second question, speaking of standardization, is are we going to standardize MOS training across the enterprise, especially AOCs? Because the process for Army nurses to become IT nurses is very different from Air Force and Navy. Different, not saying one's better than the other, nope. just different. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, those are all well, it, I was going to say all reasonable goals. I have to admit, I mean, things we've discussed, but as far as where we're at as our stand-up, it's probably not going to be something we're going to focus on in this first year, but very reasonable for the out years. So, so let's go back to why you're doing it, to some extent, more so the medics. Okay. It's because your scope of practice, okay, and I didn't understand this until I got to be the central command surgeon and walked the turf. Your scope of practice is, diff is different because it's based on the mission set that you give your medics. And believe it or not, in the combat environment, a lot, a lot of it is. Not, a, not, but most of it, when you think about it, why do you want to train that medic to that level? Because that's what you want on the ships. Why do you train that medic to that level? Because that's what you need at a, a roll one, you know, decent, decentralized, you know, support in the, in the combat. Why do you train, you know, PJs to this level where they're almost docs? Because that's what they, it's just because it's, okay, then you come back, okay, uh, and, then, and then all of a sudden a medic is not a medic. It's not a medic because you train them to a scope of, of practice that was different. Now, it goes back to the, the question I talked about on the medics. You're, what you're talking about is taking another notch is at the O level, okay, like we're talking about at the E level. And I know, I, and, I, and, I, and I wish Moulton was here because, you know, he, he, once again, okay, you know, there's three questions he shirked. So, so um, I know at the multi-service markets, okay, that is a challenge, as you can imagine. You know, you know, if you got Air Force people working in an Army hospital, it's the Army way. You know, you got, uh, you know, Army people working in a Navy hospital, it's the Navy way. It ought to be the way, okay? And I don't know enough, because I'm just hearing about this, okay? I don't know enough about what the Darwinian evolution of that was, like it was with the medics. We don't do things different. Um, there was a reason for it. But, but we'll take that back and let me figure out where we are on that, because that, that is key. Uh, don't even get me started on the staffing models, because that's what you really meant to say. That's what you really meant to say. Also, it's the staffing models, because that's driving us nuts, as you can imagine. And again, you know, our three of our top 10 biggest houses, four of them, 
Okay. Yeah, three of them. Lonstol, Walter Reed, and Samson. Okay. Or join the set. Or join the man. Okay. And that's a big chunk of change that, you know, we've got to be able to do that. We can't, you know, that's causing, the, the delivery of care is, is, is as good as it, as, as it will ever be. But it does cause what I call it, waste bandwidth, and waste energy, and waste time. But let me, I, that's good. I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll go back and find out about that. I, I wish I had a better answer for you on that. I just thought you were talking about it. Okay, one more question. Echo. a valid point and I think everyone's aware that each service has different steps that they follow and it's not that the AETC process for medics and line is not well founded and tried and true but it is sometimes laborious especially compared to the other services so yes we're hoping to take that on and that kind of falls also in that healthcare ITO office because a lot of those courses should theoretically those are the kind of discussions because that healthcare ITO office shouldn't be all about METSI and there, it should be involved with other medical training issues and, and yes, trying to expedite the process so that a change doesn't require a year or a year and a half. Because obviously, even in the Air Force, we have, we have other models of where things move faster outside of AETC. Still effective, but different. Well, yeah, he's what, because he's got that, he's got a lot of that former DNA in him. He'll, he's <laughs> he's going to figure out where the, where the, where the, where the cracks are. So, all right, so we got to move on next, to the next brief. Thank you. Thank yes, you, General Miller. Thank you. General Miller. All right.